Good afternoon. I'm Arunava Kosh, the CEO of the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water. I'm looking forward to moderating this very exciting panel on tripling renewables, making it rapid and responsible. 2023 was an extraordinary year, the warmest year on record, at least in terms of global surface temperature averages. But we also saw record investments in renewables, about $1.8 trillion of investment in clean oh, energy. So and a few weeks ago at COP28, over 120 countries agreed to triple renewable energy capacity by 2030 in the path towards net zero by 2050. Now, for some time, this whole issue around deploying renewables has centered around a conversation of money, materials, manpower, and these are certainly important issues, but today we want to go beyond. We want to get into the nuts and bolts of how to do this rapidly and responsibly. We're going to ask ourselves, are we operating with a better understanding of the timescales involved from permitting to construction to extended use? We're going to ask, are we talking to or are we talking with and engaging with communities to make sure that they are co-designers and co-participants in the energy transition. And we'll ask, are we establishing the platforms and the protocols for collaboration across geographies so that renewables can get deployed more rapidly across geographies? To discuss all of this, we've got a stellar panel, Secretary John Kerry, the US Presidential Envoy for Climate, <coughs> After that, we have Ms. Jennifer Morris, CEO of the Nature Conservancy. We have Ms. Kadri Simpson, the Commissioner for Energy of the European Commission. And on my immediate left, Mr. Ignacio Galan, Executive Chairman of Evedrola. So I'm going to start with one question to all four of you. And I don't want comments. I only want a number. You have a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being very optimistic. How optimistic are you that we can triple renewables at a global level by 2030? Just a number. Secretary Kerry. I'm sorry, you can't do it with a number. You could do either, it's possible. So yes, you'd say 10. Could you do it? Yeah, you could. In terms of uh, possibility, will we do it? Two, three. Good, so let's see if we can bridge the gap between two and 10 during this conversation. Jennifer. Seven. Seven. Ms. Simpson. Yes, we can do it, and that is also clear because now the coalition is already 132 countries large. Um, nine. Nine, wonderful. Nice. And uh, Mr. Gallan. I think from the side of the industry and consumers, eight. But it shall depend very much on the government behavior and the government support and the ambitions of the countries. So we are stretching from two <laughs> to eight, seven, eight, nine. Uh, and, uh, so but, but I want to remind you, <laughs> every one of them said it depends on it depends. This, yes. or it depends. And, on and that's that. why we are here. Now we get into the real conversation. So why don't we start with the business perspective, Mr. Galan? What would be those practical actions that are needed now to start delivering on these huge commitments at scale, but very rapidly? From a business perspective, what's the nuts and bolts you would want to focus on? So I will start for the last point I mentioned. For the side of the government legislator to provide predictability, stability, rule of law. I think we have already technology we have financial resources, we have ambition to make that happen, but I think we need already uh, to move faster. And for that, I think we need already all this one. The other second thing which is important is to promote already uh, to increase the electricity demand. So we are facing moments which I think there are in certain moments in certain countries where we have excess of renewables, which are making the depression of prices, which that is not precisely incentivating that one. So I think the acceleration of demand, electric vehicles, heat pumps, uh, green ammonia, green fertilizers, green uh, 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 methanol, et cetera, et cetera. 
Second point, and very important, the commissioner is already starting talking, and we've been already together talking about that one in, the, in, 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 in Dubai, is a grid infrastructures. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, uh, the grid is, uh, can, uh, is a bottleneck. It can be much more a bottleneck. Uh, which I think, and, and not most many countries has already still enough, men, uh, enough mentalized about the need of increasing interconnection between countries, between mm -hmm. regions, to increase already the power for providing these services of electrification I was commenting. Uh, I, will, I will put the example of electric vehicle. Electric vehicle is not already, is needed to charge it, but the charger without the grid behind is for nothing. So you need already power behind every charger. And the another point which is important, and I'm sure then it's going to be mentioned in the next future, is mm. the need of storage for avoiding precisely these times with the depression of prices. Mm -hmm. And the storage has two areas. Short and storage can be made with batteries, but we need short and long term storage, which I think we need to promote the most efficient system, which is exist at present, which is hydro pumping storage, mm -hmm. which I think is, uh, is crucial on that one. So, I think that's why uh, stability, predictability, and certain things promoting infrastructures with needs already to uh, connect this one and to uh, uh, storage and to uh, uh, supply all those ones. So you've pointed out both uh, the creation of the demand as well as the infrastructure needed to make sure that the supply side bottlenecks are removed. If I could turn to you, Commissioner Simpson, from a government or regulatory perspective, what is the European Union doing at, a, at, a, at, a, at the commission level, but also at the individual country level, to unplug some of these bottlenecks? What we see in Europe is that government after government announces uh, the dates when their power generation will be carbon free. Some of our member states plan to have 100% renewable uh, power production. Uh, some others will achieve this um, uh, with the help of nuclear. And the dates are as close as 2030, 2035. But the bigger challenge is how to achieve the larger distribution of renewables in overall um, uh, energy mix. And for that reason, we just agreed with uh, our 27 member states the target that, uh, that in overall energy consumption, we will aim the share of renewables at the level of 42.5. That means that we are also covering transport mm -hmm. and building sector and industry. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, this is a, a challenge even for Europeans. Now, in, uh, in power sector, mm. we saw a record year for renewables in 2022. The reason was that imported fossil fuels were just too expensive. And everybody, everybody really, uh, was eager to invest into the renewables. Last year, 2023, hit another record. But what we see now is that we have more renewable projects in the permitting pipeline than under construction. So uh, from our side, we have to uh, shorten the permitting. Mm -hmm. and then, of course, uh, as uh, Mr. Galan said, we have to secure that all these renewable installations will be connected to the grid, uh, because only then it makes sense to have them. Could I just make, uh, ask a follow-up question? This is a very interesting metric, the number of projects in the permitting pipeline versus the number in the construction pipeline. So give us a flavor of one or two regulatory tweaks that you might be making to shift that ratio more towards the other side, the latter side. Indeed, um, when we mapped uh, what is uh, prolonging our permitting procedures, mm -hmm. then we saw several aspects, but. Uh, one of these was that our authorities who have to grant the permits, uh, they just don't have enough stuff. So the manpower is not sufficient. Then there is a coordination issue. And, uh, and we can shorten the procedures significantly if we will digitalize mm -hmm. the processes. So simple things that we can do that uh, without uh, avoiding all these aspects that are also important to the impact of projects to our uh, um, nature and our diversity, biodiversity. So um, this is one of the things uh, that we plan to do. And another one to make um, large-scale renewables um, um, more meaningful, 
For example, we do see that we have vast potential for offshore wind, but it makes sense to cooperate. So we will start planning of these offshore uh, wind parks. For example, the call North Sea that uh, this is our future um, um, European North Sea power plant. Uh, we start plan planning uh, based on sea basin approach. So all the countries, all the markets around our sea basins, and we do have five of them, um, have to cooperate. And, uh, and instead of radial connections, mesh screed makes sense. That's an interesting example of multi-country coordination uh, to ease the permitting process. If I could hop across on the other side of the, of the ocean, mm -hmm. Secretary Kerry, I'll come to you. Uh, you mentioned right at the outset that we, it's probably 10 that we need to get to the tripling of renewables, that that we probably could. two whether we could. How, what, what is the U.S. doing to bridge that gap? Well, 10 that we could. Yeah. Because I'm an optimist, number one, and number two, we have the means. We absolutely have the means. And we know exactly what we, uh, let me strike that. We, we have most of the capacity to do it, with the exception of a couple things that have been mentioned here, and I'll mention also. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but uh, we also have the capacity to fix those things. Mm -hmm. So there's an unknown element here. We had about a 50% increase in global capacity to about 510 gigawatts just in last year. That's right. That's a damn good sign. That tells us a lot. Uh, the problem is the gap that we have to get to to achieve this is about 3,700 uh, gigawatts. It's, we need to get to the global goal of 11,000. We're currently at 7,300. So if we uh, can break loose uh, investment in grid infrastructure and begin to be able to build the cross-boundary mm -hmm. uh, transmission connections that we need, huge. That's a big step towards completing to getting to the 10%. Uh, second, the delays in administrative planning and laydown are intolerable. And we're guilty as much as any. We have 2,000 gigawatts of backed up demand in uh, waiting for FERC and folks to, you know, clear it. Mm. And we have a Congress that regrettably has not been able to reach agreement to uh, get the permitting sped up to create a statutory requirement for time frame. I am not for throwing out, uh, you know, all environmental consideration mm -hmm. and having a NEPA or whatever kind of evaluation, mm -hmm. but I'm not for taking five years to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not for having five to ten years of litigation that ties you up so it's impossible to attract the capital and it becomes that much more expensive and so forth. So we could do it. The third thing is there's policy uncertainty. You know, and uh, uh, investors need a little more certainty than the current policy provides. Uh, but the money is there and would be there because you can get a good PPA here, uh, you know, a good offtake agreement, and you've got a 30-year, 25-year source of revenue. And that's exactly what a lot of those trillions of dollars mm -hmm. are looking for out mm -hmm. there. And then finally, uh, you know, uh, uh, greater and... Uh, more controlled financing within emerging economies. Mm. But emerging economies, FYI, <clears throat> respectfully, are not going to be the ones that affect the outcome of 7,300 of, of 70, or 11,000 gigawatts because they're minuscule, they're small, and they barely contribute at all to the problem of the emissions. So the real battle here would be in the 20 largest economies of the world, which right. also are the 20 largest emitters in the world. Right. And if you get them moving, uh, we can have amazing things happen. Germany right now is probably at around 50 plus percent already, uh, and, and uh, we'll deploy more. Um, there's no, uh, uh, we have a number of countries, Indonesia and others we worked with in the jet peas that are deploying. So. We have the technology to be able to reach our goal of net zero, of uh, a 43% minimum reduction by 2030. We have the ability. Right. The question is, will we triple 
will we put these out at the rate? If we do, we can meet the goal. And if we don't uh, cure the kind of things that I just laid out, that's when I go to the downside of 5% or whatever. You can call it 2, Fair 3, 4, 5. It, it just ain't going to be what it ought to be, which is the full tripling. Fair and enough. The and, and, and you've highlighted some very practical problems, whether it's the policy certainty or the <clears throat> permitting, so, um, or even the interconnections across geographies. I think that's a very important point that both uh, you and Commissioner Simpson have brought up. Um, Jennifer Morris, if I could turn to you. When they talk about this whole issue of permitting, there's also this issue of community engagement, right? And uh, so what is the role that civil society can play uh, you know, in the geographies where, these, where this deployment is actually going to happen um, to provide the certainty that um, the community is also a stakeholder yeah. in the story. Yeah, this is hugely important. Let me explain why I said seven. So I'm an impatient optimist. <coughs> and I think everything that's been said is exactly right. We have the technology, we've got good policies. But what we're seeing, whether it's in the EU or India or Africa or in the US, where the Nation Conservancy has deep relationships with communities throughout the US, mm. is large opposition. And in fact, we're seeing it from 2018 to 2022, there was a six-fold increase in opposition to WEN projects. So to get to that 11,000, we have to be really, really smart to go fast. And there's two main things I wanted to mention. One is proper planning. We launched something at the last COP with the Global Renewables Alliance, which is a five-point plan to look at what communities, why are they opposing, to go to those areas which can be actually nature positive and really, really good for communities. I'll give you an example. I was recently in Ohio. As you know, it's a, a deeply Republican state, very big on farming, and there are signs everywhere saying no utility solar. And I asked my, my in-laws who live there, like, why is there so much opposition to solar? You're getting actually more money per acre than you are for corn or soy. Why are farmers not embracing this? Mm. And they said, we are farmers. We are not culturally equipped for this new energy. And quite frankly, we don't like how it looks. So that, I think in my mind, is a, is a, a real mistake on behalf of our whole sector of not planning ahead, not creating what I, I just want to really congratulate the EU on these renewable acceleration areas where you're actually dealing with avoiding those communities that are going to be completely opposed. And when you know there's an appropriate place that's going to be nature positive to do large scale utility wind or solar, that you're, you're able to go there and to go there much, much faster. And right now, we actually have the technology to know where that is. In the US, actually globally, we know there's 17 times the degraded land where we have community support, where we can get to that 11,000 number. But we've got to be smart of where we put this and do deep community engagement before we rush in and try to do something that's going to be opposed. And that's not just about nature, and it's not just about economic development. It's really about going fast to get to that 2030 number and that tripling goal. We have to do it in a much, much smarter, in a, in a more planning approach, which I think the, uh, the EU is leading the way on. So I'll just uh, share with you very quickly. Yes. I didn't know that about Ohio, that, that I've heard that in other places. But Ohio was the one state I needed to win. If I'd won Ohio, I'd been president of the United States. So now there are two, having this conversation. Now there are two reasons to be mad at Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so better planning next time. Yes. <laughs> um, but in, in fact, uh, uh, Jennifer, if I, if I understand this correctly, there's, what you're suggesting is it's a, it's a top-down approach towards identifying geographies that might be viable for rapid deployment and a bottom-up approach of engaging with the communities to create that narrative. Exactly, exactly. Let me give you a quick other example of success sure. story. Sure. So we have Ohio. By the way, my husband worked on your campaign in Ohio, and his county won. So congrats. <laughs> there is hope in Ohio. There is hope I don't, Yeah, exactly. I don't want to be an Ohio <laughs> basher cloned, at all. My cloned family. your husband. Yes, indeed. So uh, in eastern Kentucky, another deep red state in the United States, coal producing. In fact, one of the largest coal mines in the entire United States, which is now not producing coal um, because they're out of it, has said, we would like to do utility scale solar. Enough solar on a 7,000 acre of a former mountaintop, cleared mountaintop for coal. They're going to install enough 
renewable solar to power 500,000 homes in eastern Kentucky. I thought, they're going to be opposed to this. They're not going to like this. Well, there's two, two contributing factors why they're very supportive. One, it's out of sight. You don't see it. It's on top of a mountain. Number two, this is a community that's used to producing energy. In fact, this community is so proud of their history of energy production. They talk about how in World War II, the, the firepower for the United States was because, in no small part, of their community because they were providing coal for the military effort in World War II. So they have this pride in energy production. And now, they don't care if it's coal. It's now solar, and they continue that pride, and it's just wonderful to see if we do it smart and yep. really think about those cultural drivers for acceptance of change and go into the right places, we can get to that 2030 number. Just to emphasize that, the largest deployment, biggest, fastest deployment of wind in the United States of America and solar, Texas, mm -hmm. home of oil and gas, mm -hmm. and they understand energy, and they're fine with so I think she's made really important points, the two pieces of up and also right. pick your places. And we're going, to take, we're going to take those insights on <coughs> planning, coordination, intergeography, uh, uh, interconnections, but we'll take it beyond the geographies we've been talking about. Secretary Kerry, you're absolutely right that from an emissions perspective, it's the top 20 countries that matter, but within those top 20 countries are also some rapidly growing emerging economies. True. And um, if I just, for a few seconds, just took off my moderator hat, uh, the country I come from, India, went from less than 20 megawatts of solar in 2010 to now the fourth largest renewables market in the world. Um, but even in such geographies, there has to be rapid deployment. So in the context of narrative building um, to engage with communities, I think one of the things that often gets missed out is, as the IEA estimates, about 30 million new jobs could be created in this. We've estimated that using distributed renewables for livelihood activities is a $50 billion market in India, $12 billion market in Africa. So I want to come back to each one of you and maybe again start with Jennifer very quickly. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit beyond the developed markets? How do you engage with communities where this rapid deployment can happen, even in emerging markets? So everyone feels they have a stake in this in, in this transition. Yeah, that's it's really important. And I'll just mention um, we just launched a, a tool today with that's a, now a global map of solar and wind with Microsoft and Planet, which can basically show we can take it walk into say in India a policymaker's hand and say this is where your solar and wind is happening because often they don't actually have that data at a national level. And how we've we've said to them is you know you can actually see from this analysis that the solar is happening faster in certain states and not others. Um, and so having a, 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 the technology and the data sets that are visual and are usable by policymakers will enable them to see, okay, maybe we should be putting more solar or wind in this particular geography and not in this one, where there's, in certain geographies, in India, for example, and other countries as well, there's been an overabundance and a cluster of this energy in certain certain places. So how do we make sure we're finding those areas that are degraded, but we're also doing it in a way that's distributed in a way that, that more people can benefit it from it? That's one way. Mr. So, Galan, if I could come to you. I mean, again, Ibadrola operates across multiple geographies. Give us a flavor of how could technology help, uh, you know, this planning and permitting and coordination better? Is there some any tools Ibadrola is using or exploring uh, to speed up the transition? Well, I think we started 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. I've been, for many years, I've been saying that the main bottleneck was permitting. And I'm very glad that people talk about permitting. I think you are aware that in all my conversation in Brussels, permitting, permitting. So I, I would like to ask something about this, uh, how to engage the local communities. So uh, uh, I grew in a, in a rural area, I grew in a village. And I think I know a bit how the farmers behave, how they think. And I think in many cases, we, big utilities, we are very arrogant. We go there, said, we are going to make that one because we are powerful, strong, and that's good. But I think, uh, got, got these uh, people there touch on that one. And I think mm -hmm. we have to engage on that one. We have already made some engagement with certain communities such a way all the citizens of this community has already in their energy bill some price 
because we have already, beside our big uh, scale, utility scale, uh, whatever farm, is another not um, utility scale, which is just for their own. It's their own. They are already owners of that one. The second thing is not to disturb their traditional way of life. I think if they have uh, ships or they have cattle, they have not to say, Alma, is my land, I'm going to pay that one. No. They continue grazing in the same place they've been grazing for years with the ships. We are seeing that, for instance, we demonstrate the biodiversity in this area increases. People have to be aware that that happened as well because they, they're that better on that one. I think sometimes, and I have to say, uh, because of my experience of 25 years, we are, in some cases, administration, public powers, and the utilities, and the utility. We are too arrogant. We need to be much modest in the way we treat these local communities, uh, just showing what are the benefits for them, how they can benefit of that one in all terms. Could, it, could, I, could you give an example I see. where we've been humble and, and I can tell you Cedillo, the area where this guy comes from. It's a small village okay. in the middle of nowhere. It's a populated, very low population. I think that is an important thing as well. We have not to go to make this thing in areas which are highly populated. Mm -hmm. I think you try to make a wind farm in a place which is 300 habitants per square mile, I think forget. But I think you have to go to like his area which is seven habitants per square kilometer. Okay. So which is, it's an area which is adding something to those one. What is the experience? I think these people is already first, we try, then all construction is with local jobs. We take already all the area, 20, 30, 50 kilometers around, and we force our suppliers, okay. then the people, employees, people from local area. Second thing is making this thing I was mentioned to you, all the people in the village, not only the, 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 the public uh, the local budget benefit, no, no, themselves in their bill. So in the bill, they see that now my electricity was costing 10, now it's costing 5, mm -hmm. because we own this part of the They feel owner of that one. Mm. The third one is to uh, uh, try to reskill the people of these areas for use in other places. Okay. I'm very proud that certain of the places in his uh, homeland as well, which is the west part of Spain, and uh, these people has been Reeducated, educated, and this has already created. We generate jobs not only for this one, they are moving across the country now, and the Ben electricians, whatever, are ready because we <coughs> create local school for electricians to transform these people who have been farmers for life okay. so to do another thing. So we need to, to, to transmit a sense of ownership of that one. Fair enough. If not, it doesn't work. Fair enough. So now let's take those lessons out to the world as a whole. And let me come back to Commissioner Simpson and Secretary Kerry. Uh, if you've got to rapidly deploy renewables, triple them over the next seven years, what is the role of international cooperation here? Not just in target setting, but in actual deployment. Uh, Commissioner Simpson, could I start with you? What, what is the European Commission doing to support with technology dissemination or co-creating um, these, these projects in, in other geographies? First of all, we lead by example. Lead by. And, uh, and I just wanted to share with you a, a, a short moment uh, that we have discovered in Europe that you can rapidly install renewables um, in uh, densely populated places too because there are territories where you don't have other competitors. Uh, these are rooftops. Mm -hmm. So uh, for us, newly built industrial sites have to well install also rooftop solar, and, uh, and we have done so, so also for, uh, for public buildings. And for farmers um, um, across uh, um, different uh, geographical regions, but uh, it makes more sense in the southern part where you have lots of sun, you can combine successfully um, agri-PVs with um, um, production, these solar PVs are just uh, on the higher ground and give shade at these months where, uh, where otherwise your crop will, uh, uh, will get too much uh, heat and sunshine. Since we created this coalition at COP28, mm -hmm. triple uh, renewables by the end of um, um, this decade, European Commission has also um, informed 
the signatories so that uh, we will dedicate additional 2.3 billion euros um, to assist governments who, who need our assistance to, to improve um, energy efficiency gains, but also to install new renewables. And of course, we do understand that uh, to be able to install renewables, they have to strengthen also their electricity grids. We have done that back home. We know that we need to, to smarten our grids even more to allow small producers and consumers to connect mm -hmm. their, uh, their um, solar panels. And we can share the knowledge and we can uh, support financially. Of course, it's not enough. And for, for really materializing uh, uh, the, um, the plans that, uh, that um, do exist, we call all the multinational development banks. Mm -hmm. Lacked also swiftly because uh, financing is a key. Uh, Secretary, you were championing something called the Energy Transition Accelerator. Uh, could you give us a flavor of how that mechanism might work towards getting uh, more investment going towards uh, emerging markets and deploying sure. rapidly? I'd be delighted to. And, and if I may, I'd add a couple of other quick observations on this, on the international piece. Um, the ETA, called the uh, Energy Transition Accelerator, is uh, basically a reaction to my early travel three years ago in this job of going to countries, emerging economies, Africa, various places, where you were trying to get the leaders to make a different set of decisions about what they would deploy, uh, i.e., you know, they had gas, they could exploit it, a number of them do have gas and want to exploit it, but they didn't understand how they had other options, whether it was geothermal or solar renewable, you know, of one kind or another, or even nuclear or something in some cases. So um, the biggest single handicap in their willingness to make the decision to deploy smart was money. We didn't have the money. And, uh, and no country has enough money nowadays to do what we need to do with the trillions of dollars that need to be deployed in order to affect this transition. So how do we win? We win by being smarter about creating bankable deals around mm -hmm. the world. And you can create those bankable deals, particularly with blended finance, you can utilize, we've just had two or three sessions here about the Gaia program. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with charity. Uh, charitable institutions could leverage very significantly, coupled with some public money from state, uh, from uh, national entities. And that would help to deal with the World Bank. You sort of have this combination in this full blended form. And you can attract uh, capital to the table because you can de-risk the deal. And if you have first loss being taken by a philanthropy, for instance, mm -hmm. or you set up a structure where your lineup, your, your, your chain of credit uh, is uh, such that uh, people feel protected, uh, or you have a guarantee even, mm -hmm. I think we should be getting people to be willing to make guarantees. I, I wouldn't hesitate on the right projects to be issuing a, a national federal guarantee. Now, it's not my job, and I don't get to do that. Uh, <laughs> Um, but it would make the world of difference to our ability to accelerate all of these things. So the ETA is actually uh, a program to bring back a viable voluntary carbon market initiative where we can, in fact, buy offsets, we being you know, corporations or countries. You can buy an offset, but it's going to be done according to very high level of high environmental integrity, we're, we've been working, we've had a national consultative group of 30 people, you served on it, thank you very much, uh, where we're trying to make sure we really understand by making the marketplace jurisdictional, which means the entire region or country, so you're not picking projects here and there, uh, and that's where games get played. Uh, and unfortunately, some fly-by-night artists who will take advantage of a sort of unregulated market mm. uh, have abused and given mm -hmm. a bad name. Mm -hmm. We think we can restore the name. We can come in with high integrity rules and guardrails. Uh, and we're talking with SBTI and VCMI and everybody mm -hmm. to try to get everybody on board. Mm -hmm. I think we can get there. And that will enable us to really not just deploy renewables, but to protect forests, 
to you know, do the things we need to do. Now, we did a model of this in Egypt mm. with the Nuefe program for the, last, for the COP in Sharm el Sheikh, mm -hmm. where we took uh, $500 million of our money. When I say our money, we had Germany, the United States, a few folks tripped in, right. bank, the EBDRD. And uh, that 500 million greased the skids for 20 billion total, 10 billion of public and 10 billion of private sector of capital to come to the table. What would it do? It was going to help pay and, and affect a transition of 11 gas turbines that were going to be closed, and we would open 10 gigawatts worth of renewable energy. Right. So that kind of incentive could be replicated. We you know, that could help us uh, meet our goal here. The second, the, the second and not only did we do that, but we worked with Indonesia on a Jet P program. Yes. We did it with Vietnam on a Jet P program. And they, they, have, have agree, they have to agree that they're going to deploy X amount of more renewable. So this is another way that we could, sure. in the international arena, we can do our part uh, by putting some money on the line, by bringing people together, convening, cajoling, leveraging, and getting these deals put together. And we, have, we have very little time left, but I do want to, again, come back uh, to um, uh, Jennifer, to you first, and then uh, maybe to you, Mr. Galan, about how do we, I mean, clean energy is good, but clean energy also needs to be nature positive. And if it's going to happen in the same geography, again, that seems to become some sort of a limitation. So how do we solve for that in order for the clean energy to be deployed very rapidly. Any one specific example, if you can give? Yes. In the state of Virginia, the largest contributor to deforestation is not agriculture, it's solar. That's unacceptable. We should not be destroying forests for our solar ambitions. So we know where the degraded lands are. We know where there's low biodiversity, low conflicts with farmers, with communities. So let's be smart about it and not just deploy. So we want to do it fast, and we know we can do it. If we, we want to go fast, we have to do it in a much smarter, much more holistic thinking about these, these issues before we just rapidly go in. Mr. Galan, again, is there any technology tool we could use to map both the clean energy potential and make sure it's nature positive as we deploy at scale? Well, I, I think I'm shocked with this thing you had mentioned, that for making solar, you're cutting trees. I think we have a program just the opposite. We have a program of, of planting 20 million trees worldwide. No. Yes, I, I'm really, I'm really shocked on that one. So, <laughs> I think it's what we are doing. So we are trying to use our uh, artificial intelligence for defining what is the areas which uh, we can uh, already uh, optimize uh, the uh, wind production. So what are the in the, the areas? But we can make that one. Uh, we have already, yes, as I mentioned, trying to engage as much as we can the local communities on this one. The fact we have a program, we, we call the program Convive. Convive is, uh, I don't know the translation, partners, partnership. So with uh, local communities, we make an event every year in different region in which we invite those uh, areas we has been transformed as consequence of that one. Today, for instance, so mining areas of coal mining areas, we closed uh, the coal power plant many years ago, and we are transforming this one. We are there producing now solar panels. Not only we are putting already there, uh, so wind farms, of, uh, but they are producing, they are making their own solar panel. We transform uh, areas of shipyards, which today they are already manufacturing our foundation and our substation for offshore. Mm. So in the thinning countries like Germany, like France, like Spain, like Britain. So in what do you use? We use their skill in welding. So, but I think that in the region is seeing the benefits of this, uh, let's say, transition. So I think for me it's very important that the citizens mm -hmm. in the areas where we are allocating those ones feel then they are already benefit on that one. There are some things which uh, I always, uh, when I discuss with, uh, we are in third world countries as well, and I think the third world countries, emerging countries, have the opportunity mm -hmm. of jumping from mm -hmm. no electricity to clean electricity without passing through what we've been passing this time. Fortunately for them, the cost today of a solar, of a wind, is cheaper than any other technology. So, Today, the capex, the investment needed for an offshore, 
It's similar to a coal power plant. Why to make coal when you can make offshore? Okay. So we've got one minute left. We've got to wrap up. But I'm going to go back to that same question I started with. Having heard these different solutions, examples from your countries as well as from across the world, uh, does your vote change on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being very optimistic? Can we get there uh, in terms of tripling renewables? Just a number again in the reverse order. Mr. Galan? I said the number. I said eight. Eight. I'm still a very optimistic nine. Nine. I'm going to go eight and make sure we use a tool called Site Renewables Right. To make Wonderful. So you've gone from seven to eight? Yes. Secretary Kerry. I believe we can get there if we can make some of the changes we talked about here today. If we do those things, we can get there. I think what ought to drive us is the fact that we can get there. Wonderful. I, I heard um, two for me, just to summarize, thank you. Just to summarize, uh, I got uh, 10 points on how to get to 10. One, policy certainty. Two, demand generation. Three, staffing. Four, coordination across geographies. Five, mapping the areas, including using AI. Six, blended finance. Seven, sorry, uh, seven beyond land-based to rooftop renewables. Eight, make it nature positive. Nine, get the right skills going. And 10, most importantly, humility. Thank you very much. Please join our hands. Can I politely make a recommendation? That we agree, we take those 10 things, we put them together as, uh, and, and, and get them out there mm. as a conclusion of this group so that there's something out there that's really Great. you can build on and organize around. And we ought to be figuring out how we're going to create some entity that will organize around that. Mm. Well, I think uh, we should... Uh, we should recognize that this session has been uh, and, and has been put together, and a lot of the issues that came up have been covered by the World Economic Forum's Center for Energy and Materials. And perhaps these ten, this 10-point 10 agenda can be something that the center can take forward. And we come back here next January to ask how much progress did we make on these 10 points. Please put your hands together to thank Secretary Kerry, thank you. Jennifer Morris, Commissioner Simpson, and Mr. Galan. Thank you very much.